Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Boaz. I'm the university librarian uh, in Lehigh University Libraries. Uh, uh, we with us today is uh, Dr. Anthony DiMaggio. Uh, he's going to be talking about conspiracy theories and some of the situations that are happening right now in our politics. Uh, this is uh, this uh, lecture is a part of a series uh, sponsored by the Friends of the Lehigh Libraries Group. Uh, the group is active for uh, almost, uh, well, more than 40 years, <laughs> uh, thinking about, you know, how to uh, champion the library causes, uh, programs, uh, and innovation that happens in the libraries um, on a daily basis. So uh, if you're uh, near us, think about joining us. Uh, if you want to visit the libraries, you can visit the libraries right now. Uh, we have uh, a, an exhibit in the Lindemann Library uh, about dictionaries and their uh, relevancy to the curriculum uh, and their history. Uh, this is a, an exhibit by Special Collections, um, so uh, really amazing. <laughs> Please go and visit. And if you uh, are in the Fritschermatende Library, uh, there is a, an exhibit that is in the works called FML, uh, <laughs> good acronym. Uh, it is about, uh, it's, uh, the acronym stands for For My Legacy, so students uh, share their past, present, and future um, ideas about themselves, uh, and they, there is a competition, and we're going to be uh, also uh, celebrating the winners uh, uh, during the semester. Uh, otherwise, uh, there are two more uh, programs that are coming uh, by the uh, Friends Group. There is uh, one in March 24 uh, by Professor Danagal G. Young uh, about irony and outrage, uh, the polarized landscape of rage, fear, and laughter uh, in the US. And in April 6, uh, same time, 4.30, uh, Andrea Smith, Associate Professor of Anthropology from Lafayette College. Uh, he, she's going to be uh, talking about who decided to commemorate the walking purchase and why 1920s fanfare and local opposition. So uh, we are all about uh, um, interesting, relevant uh, discussions uh, in, in our libraries. So uh, feel free to talk with us and, and debate <laughs> and uh, explore your intellectual freedom. Um, the Friends Group, uh, I wanna uh, mention uh, Judy Parr, our uh, president of the Friends and our programming committee that really uh, work hard <laughs> to get us going and have uh, those uh, monthly uh, celebrations together with really, really great speakers. So um, today uh, we're gonna be talking with Dr. Anthony DiMaggio. Um, he's, uh, he's the Associate Professor of Political Science at Lea University. Uh, his research and teaching emphasize the interactions between politics, social movements, the news media, propaganda, and the American right. Uh, he's the author of 11 scholarly books, unbelievable, <laughs> including Rising, uh, fascism in America, political power in America, rebellion in America, and unequal America. Uh, he has been an active participant in social movement politics for the last two decades and is an avid social commentator. So uh, I'm going to uh, hand it to you now, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, too. And I appreciate everybody uh, being here and taking this time to uh, spend with us. So the, the title of this uh, talk is Conspiracy Theories and the Manufacture of Dissent. This actually comes out of um, my interests in a number of different areas. Uh, for the last 15 years, really, I've been studying political propaganda, official rhetoric, how that rhetoric is um, received in the news media and by Americans, and how this relates to the political process. So uh, just to give you some context here, you know, I, I had recently published uh, an article with critical uh, sociology that, that summarizes a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today. So if you are interested in that, um, I would suggest um, taking a look. The title is uh, Conspiracy Theories and the Manufacture of Dissent. It sounds similar, right? 
<laughs> yeah, so in critical sociology, just published this year. I'm also working on a, a book on fake news, which uh, should be published next year in 2023. So basically, this is a labor of love that you know, uh, is, is multiple years in the making. Um, I'm really sort of interested and fascinated with how consciousness gets constructed. Like how do people's realities get constructed? And so uh, on the one hand, this is all very fascinating. We talk about conspiracy theories, but on the other hand, it's also very depressing and disturbing. When you talk about large numbers of people, tens of millions in some cases that have, that have been systematically misinformed. So, uh, and you know, just to give you sort of a, a basic understanding of where I wanna go with this, um, thematically speaking. What I have been arguing in my, my recent article and in my book and in my research is that uh, in this modern era, and, and particularly like the last 10 years, I would say, um, we have seen the beginnings of the breakdown of the American political party system and the US media system in a particular way, particularly via uh, rising the rising embrace of misinformation on a massive scale and, and particularly conspiracy theories. Now, this is coming from specific places when I talk about the breakdown of parties and the media, particular uh, political officials, particular media venues, particularly the Republican right. Uh, the, the Republican Party has become the party of conspiracies. You have right-wing internet-based media sources and other sources, uh, for example, on cable with Fox News and other uh, venues like OAN uh, and Newsmax. And, and also I'm looking at social media. What role does social media play in all of this? And so all of these are really important questions. Um, if you look at the classic book that was written uh, about three decades ago, a little bit more at this point, uh, by Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman, they wrote a book called Manufacturing Consent. And so it was a fascinating book. It didn't really look at public opinion, but it did look at the way in which political officials try to use the media to uh, build public support for their agendas. And that there is an effort out there on the part of these political leaders to manufacture public support behind their, their political ideas and agendas. And so I've sort of, um, I wouldn't say I had an issue with that uh, sort of framing recently in the last particularly five to 10 years, but I think that we could go beyond it because I think it is the case that political leaders try to manufacture consent. I think that that's still the case today. They need votes, they need support, but we've entered into a new era where there's also the effort to manufacture dissent, what I would call faux dissent. And so there's lots of reasons that keep, people could be angry at government, whether you're Republican or Democrat or independent. You know, we don't have to manufacture reasons. And yet there are lots of things that are being manufactured that people are angry about and they say that government is doing. And so what's happening here is that uh, distrust is being stoked on a massive level against government, ironically by people in government. And this isn't necessarily surprising if you understand that traditionally the conservative philosophy is, is stoking distrust in government, right? And the idea that people should rely on government less. What better way to do that than to convince people that at every turn government is uh, in league with shadowy actors trying to hurt you or harm you or kill you. It might really uh, hurt public confidence in what government can do and stifle any effort to utilize government to aid the mass public. So a little bit of this is sort of um, conjecture in the sense that political leaders will never admit that. But a lot of this has to do with uh, being aligned with longstanding conservative sort of rhetoric about um, distrusting government. And so when you see this coming from the Republican Party, it's hard to disassociate these things. Um, I think we've entered a qualitatively new era with regards to our media. And I argue this in my book where with the rise of online sort of alternative venues that are outside of traditional news sites like a CNN or the New York Times or something like that, um, they we're seeing an important shift with these kinds of informational alternative websites. Uh, I talk particularly in my research about websites and uh, venues like Infowars, the notorious Alex Jones website, uh, cable media like Fox News and others I mentioned. And what, so what we're seeing with the proliferation of all different types of media is the decline of traditional gatekeeping media. These were the media that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, before the rise of, of the internet, before the rise of social media, they had more of a monopoly on credibility and, and the kind of information people consumed. So we could be talking about, you know, the Washington Posts of the world or the New York Times and so on, maybe even your local newspaper. But these, uh, these venues are really being challenged. And so with the proliferation of all different types of media and fragmentation of audiences, and with the rise of social media, you're just seeing a lot of people getting information from a lot of different places. And this has opened the floodgates 
they've really been opened uh, and the filter that used to exist has been really challenged and removed to an extent in terms of these traditional professional journalists who are trained to, to filter out bad information and nonsense. Now journalists are increasingly feeling like they have to address the nonsense and, and garbage uh, information if a lot of people are trafficking in it, particularly with conspiracy theories, because they it's hard to ignore them. And so what's this, what this has done uh, when I say the floodgates have been opened is that we, we've seen the rise of mass confusion, mass misinformation. Um, and so, you know, I think this is important. The, the, the claims that I'm making here are important to lay out because um, it's worth sort of bringing up here that there are alternative claims that are being made to the ones that I'm making here. Um, and, and here are some of these alternative claims. You know, one is that social media are not an, an actor working on behalf of, of right-wing uh, Republican interests and conspiracies, uh, that they're hotbeds of intolerance for the right, and particularly in the era with Trump being deplatformed, right? After January 6th, this has been a narrative that has gotten a lot of cachet in the United States, that social media are very much liberally biased, intolerant of, of right-wing views. Uh, they deplatform Trump. And so I'm arguing really the opposite of that, that these venues are being mobilized for right-wing misinformation and conspiracies. Um, there's also been a lot of sort of uh, disagreement among scholars and intellectuals about just how important social media and partisan media are, because it may be the case that, you know, what's called an echo chamber is in effect, right? So maybe people tune into Fox to just be told what they already believe. Maybe uh, they're just operating in echo chambers on social media that tell them what they already believe. Well, is that the case? Or are these social media venues and, and partisan venues like Fox News, are they systematically sort of changing the way people look at politics and polarizing people even more than they already were? So this disagreement among intellectuals and scholars is something that I'm really interested in. And I'm arguing the opposite of that, that, that social media and partisan media are really having a dramatic impact. They're not just reinforcing people's beliefs, but they're strengthening and creating new beliefs. And sometimes there's also been this claim, uh, I've heard this among scholars and intellectuals and partisan uh, political officials, that, well, both sides do this kind of stuff, right? Like both sides, Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, they, they engage in outlandish rhetoric and conspiracies and heated uh, language. And really, that's not what I've found in, in my research. Uh, you have one political party in particular with the Republican Party that now deals in conspiracies as their currency, one after another. Uh, so it's not to say that there aren't conspiracies that Democrats and liberals uh, accept and, and people on the left, but it's not a, a proportionate thing of both sides sort of equivalence. That, that's really a false equivalent argument. So yeah, I'm, I'm really challenging a lot of these sort of views that, that have been put forward. I don't think that any of these things are accurate. Um, I find in my research that, that social media are really a prime disseminator of right-wing misinformation and conspiracies. Fox News has a dramatic impact, I've found in my research, on polarizing people and moving them to the right. And something that you just don't see with people who watch CNN or MSNBC being pulled more to the left and in a liberal direction. Um, that there's an asymmetric polarization going on, uh, that one side that we're seeing quite a bit of polarization and nowhere near that on the other side. Um, with regard to social media, there is evidence with the case studies I'm looking at one after another, that it's not just echo chambers. It's not just people who are sort of like logged into communities of like-minded people who are just being reinforced in their beliefs. These outlets seem to be having a dramatic qualitative impact on pulling people to the right in terms of embracing right-wing conspiracies across the board, not just among Republican users or conservative users. Um, and with regard to the Republican Party and conspiracy theories, it's important to point out there's only one party that has had a president that regularly traffics in conspiracies in modern times, and that person's name is Donald Trump, and that party is the Republican Party. Whether we're talking about QAnon or what's been called big lie election conspiracy propaganda, um, you know, these kinds of conspiracies uh, have been embraced at the top levels of the Republican Party. So uh, what I want to do a little bit before I talk about my research is uh, go into a couple definitions really quickly. Um, when I talk about um, propaganda and disinformation within the context of this presentation, I am talking about conspiracies as a form of propaganda because it's false information, or at least information that hasn't been validated. Um, oftentimes I use the word disinformation as sort of a synonym for propaganda in the sense that when people talk about disinformation, they are talking about the way in which uh, bad faith actors manipulate informational environments, that they distort information, that they use fear 
uh, against some sort of amorphous shadowy other. And uh, the reason you know, why I say bad faith is because when we look at a lot of the case studies that I'm gonna talk about, if these people don't know that these things are false, they should, because there has been such a massive amount of research and evidence presented by professional journalists, by other uh, academics, medical experts with regard to COVID-19 to really demolish all these conspiracies. And when you look at a lot of the prime disseminators of these conspiracies, these disinformation actors, you know, they have been told repeatedly that these things aren't true and they've been presented with the evidence and they just look the other way. So that to me speaks to a bad faith sort of engagement. So, you know, the, the idea of disinformation Information here and propaganda are, are really important concepts. Uh, misinformation is different. You know, disinformation is this idea that there are bad faith actors out there, they're, they're manipulating reality, right? Um, misinformation is the idea that there are people out there in mass that accept these ideas. They may hold them in good faith, they've just been misinformed, right? And so these are different things. Um, it's talking about an effect more so than the actual uh, supply side of the content being disseminated. So there's a receiving side, um, excuse me, a demand side, or demand side is the receiver, right? Supply side is the message. So, you know, misinformation is really more about uh, the demand side, the people that consume the information and then they get misinformed. Um, conspiracy theory, what is that? Well, the way that this commonly gets defined by academics is uh, the notion that people uh, pr uh, promulgate that there are these powerful, shadowy, secret actors out there, usually working with the government in some way to confuse the public, to harm people, to push ulterior motives outside of what they say they're actually doing and want to do. And so I think that's a pretty straightforward definition of conspiracy and something important to point out here. What I'm really doing in my research is, um, you know, I'm looking at the way in which different types of media engage with conspiracies. And then I'm looking at uh, the receiver side, the public, and, and, and sort of how susceptible people are to them. So when I say research methods here, I mean, uh, one way that I'm doing this is through what's called content analysis. You can use databases online like Nexus Uni, uh, and you can just you know, follow these venues in general to analyze content. So I'm looking at a lot of traditional news media like the New York Times, broadcast media venues, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, Infowars, you can go to their website and you can study them. And you can find uh, patterns in content through what's called qualitative and quantitative content analysis, just by looking at themes for qualitative research and by like uh, researching the actual number of times that certain themes come up with regard to quantitative research. So that's an important part of this. You know, you wanna understand what messages are coming from where before you can try to understand the impact that it's having on people. I'm also looking a lot at public opinion polling data. Um, this stuff is out there from the Pew Research Center and other polling groups. And social scientists use something called statistical regression analysis, which basically means, in a, to take that fancy term and, and make it simple, that you're looking for associations between people who consume more or less of a certain type of media and whether they are more likely to hold certain types of beliefs. But you can actually do statistically uh, if you, if you know how to use these kinds of research methods, is you can uh, take into account other factors as well and hold them constant. You can account for them. Things like uh, someone's political partisanship, their ideology, their income, their age, their race, their gender, their level of education. And if you control for those things and account for them, you can make a stronger argument that something like media consumption may be having an impact on people's beliefs. Uh, if you notice that certain types of media consumers believe different things than other types of media consumers. So that's really what I'm doing in my research. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what I'm looking at in terms of topics, I'm really interested in particularly the last 10 to 15 years. Um, during the Obama administration with the Affordable Care Act, there was legislation uh, that uh, a lot of Republicans uh, claimed had uh, something in it called death panels. This idea that the, the Democratic Party wanted to create panels that the government would administer that would deny life-saving care to people with illnesses, elderly Americans and, and other people with, with pre-existing conditions. This was never true, um, but it became a very prominent message after Sarah Palin popularized this on Facebook. And then other Republicans either tolerated it or disseminated it on Fox News and, and elsewhere. Um, I'm looking at something called birtherism. If you're not familiar with that, uh, it was this idea that Obama was secretly not an American citizen. He was born in another country. He was part of some sort of secret conspiracy to uh, impose foreign control over the U.S. by getting a, a non-citizen to be president. 
So birtherism is an important part of the sort of picture here with modern conspiracies. I'm looking at the QAnon conspiracy. For people not familiar, uh, this is a really exotic one. You know, this is this idea that the Democrats are secretly in, meet, in league with uh, Hollywood to drink the blood of children and, and act as cannibals, that they're satanic, um, that Donald Trump, the leader, is going to overthrow the, that party. And these people are going to be uh, hung from streetlights in public executions as they're exposed by Donald Trump and, and the QAnon movement. Um, so yeah, quite exotic stuff here. Um, yeah, uh, that's that's a diplomatic way of putting it. So uh, yeah, the QAnon is an important part of this. Um, the COVID-19 conspiracies, so many of these, right? But some of the big ones I'm looking at are you know, this claim that, that 5G cell phone towers were secretly responsible for, for coronavirus. There was a documentary called Plandemic. Uh, I say documentary loosely. I wouldn't really call it one, but that, you know, it was framed that way by supporters of the documentary uh, that claimed that like COVID-19 was a secret plot by government leaders and other shadowy actors in the business sector. Um, the idea that um, COVID-19 is a biological weapon created in a lab in China. You know, this is the kind of stuff that, that I'm studying with regard to COVID-19 conspiracies. And finally, what's called big lie election conspiracy propaganda. This is the big lie, the idea going back to Joseph Goebbels and um, Adolf Hitler, that if you tell a lie enough times, people will believe it. And one of the biggest lies of all in modern times was that the 2020 election was stolen from Donald Trump um, by Joe Biden and the Democratic Party. Although, you know, there were dozens of lawsuits involving this that the Trump administration filed and they failed to present any evidence in any of them. And their own Department of Justice basically said that they didn't have any evidence for this. Uh, so it's definitely not accurate and it's a conspiracy, but it, it has been a very prominent one. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at all of these different conspiracies. I'm looking at media coverage. I'm looking at public opinion and possible media effects. What I find time and time again is that um, there are certain factors that are associated over and over and over with people being more likely statistically to embrace these conspiracies. Uh, and what are we talking about? We're talking about number one, Republican partisanship. Number two, um, social media use and content. And, and other times, uh, other alternative sort of media content like Fox News consumption and InfoWars consumption. And on the other side, there is uh, at least there's one big factor outside of uh, when we talk about parties, you know, Democrat versus Republican. Yes, Democrats are less likely to, to accept these conspiracies. So party matters on that side, sure. But uh, really the big factor is traditional news consumption. People who uh, are not getting their news primarily from social media, or from Fox News or Infowars or other questionable sites, but people who say that they rely on national news media in general, the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, um, and PR, you know, these kinds of venues, depending on the survey questions you look at, these things are, of course, worded differently, depending on the question, but, but they're all sort of grouped in the same camp of traditional older style media that were considered gatekeeping media for decades. So what I end up finding uh, looking at these case studies is that, for example, with death panels in 2009 and the birtherism controversy in 2011, is that, uh, number one, Republican Americans were much more likely, significantly more likely to accept these conspiracies when you look at the polling data. Um, people who consumed traditional news media that I mentioned, like the New York Times and others, were much more likely to reject these conspiracies. Well, it's not surprising why. These media outlets I show in my content analyses we're systematically more likely to reject these conspiracies out of hand. They just didn't take them seriously. They, they did report on them pretty heavily, but they rejected them out of hand as groundless, as baseless. And the people who uh, consumed these media, as you would expect, were more likely to reject them after controlling for all types of other factors like partisanship, ideology, age, gender, race, education, and so on. Where were these things coming from then? Well, you know, venues like Fox News were disseminating these things. Republican leaders like Sarah Palin and Donald Trump were disseminating these conspiracies and promoting them. Uh, social media, you know, uh, unfortunately, this is sort of the era, 2009 to 2011, before a lot of the polling organizations started regularly asking people about how often they consume social media and in relation to, to polls being done on politics. So we only have some impressionistic findings from these early conspiracies. And, and then the findings get better later on when we talk about modern conspiracies. But the impressionistic findings are not good. We know that, that uh, Facebook was the primary place where the death panels controversy 
originated because that's where Sarah Palin popularized it. And then it really snowballed from there onto Fox News. Other Republican leaders were talking about it and then traditional media covered it. We know with regards to the birther conspiracy that this was Donald Trump among other uh, actors. And, and I say bad faith actors because he was confronted by people like Anderson Cooper on CNN and others and told repeatedly that this was not true, that the, the birth certificate had been released multiple times short form, long form, uh, newspapers had, had and journalists had seen it. The governor of Hawaii had seen it. Like this had been certified many times over formally, informally, it had been reviewed uh, and it didn't seem to matter. Uh, so in, in Donald Trump's case, you know, he was using uh, forums like interviews, yes, but Twitter. You know, so this is uh, not good in terms of early warning signs here. These are red flags that the venues like Twitter and Facebook were being mobilized early on as the primary points of dissemination for these conspiracies. And when we look at some of these other conspiracies, we see that, that this becomes um, even, even worse. So looking at QAnon, for example, this is something that Donald Trump in 2020 retweeted from QAnon accounts dozens of times and said very uh, clearly when he was asked by journalists about this, that QAnon likes him and, and these are in, uh, important people who are against pedophilia. He was winking left and right at, at QAnon. Um, and it wasn't just him, you had other Republican leaders like Marjorie Taylor Greene and others who, who also uh, popularized this, Paul Gosar and, and many others. And um, so we know where this was coming from originally with the Republican Party, like these other conspiracies. We also know uh, that the Republicans were more likely to, to buy into these conspiracies, yes, according to the polling data, but it wasn't just them. It was also people relying on social media. Um, the polling data that I looked at shows pretty clearly that there's a significant difference between people who relied, for example, on national print media like the New York Times and people who say they relied on social media for their information when it came to being more likely or less likely to accept the QAnon conspiracy. Now, this is really important when we talk about social media because it's not just Republicans or conservatives who were doing this. Social media use in general was associated with being more likely to accept the QAnon conspiracy after taking into account and controlling for things like uh, per people's partisanship and their ideology. So this is a really important point. This is not just echo chambers. This is not just a few people. This is the venue itself being susceptible to, to bad faith actors, rotten information, and just systematic uh, misinformation on the part of users. Uh, and we see this time and time again with different cases. We see with regards to COVID-19, uh, people who were being exposed to and increasingly susceptible to this claim that, that 5G cell phone towers were uh, responsible for COVID-19 and the creation of it and its spread. Um, this was something that social media users systematically uh, were more likely to be exposed to compared to people who said they relied on traditional print news media. We know that uh, Republican Americans as well were more susceptible to this. We know that with regard to the claim that COVID-19 was created as a biological weapon, that there were differences in uh, number one, partisanship. Republicans were much more likely to fall into this conspiracy. Um, people who consumed Infowars, yes. Fox News, yes. Um, and if you actually look at the content from these sites, you had places like Fox News Infowars that were trafficking in these kinds of claims that, that maybe COVID-19 was created as a biological weapon by China. We know that people who said so they consumed broadcast news media like ABC, CBS, NBC, The New York Times, CNN, and other venues like those were significantly more likely to reject this conspiracy about the biological weapons. Now, I want to be perfectly clear here. As a social scientist, um, I don't think that it's our place to reject any claim if uh, there is serious evidence being presented in favor of it. So when people talk about, you know, COVID-19 as having escaped from a lab potentially in China accidentally or intentionally being created, I don't discount any possibility. Um, but at a certain point, evidence has to matter, doesn't it? Like, you know, if these things have been floating around for years, and they have been, and people haven't presented definitive evidence that these things are true, that kind of has to matter at some point if you're engaged in rational thinking on these things. Like, to take these things seriously, at some point that evidence has to be presented. And if it isn't, then we have a problem here with regards to these different venues that people are consuming where they're buying into these conspiracies that, that have not been demonstrated and documented. Um... With regards to the, the big lie points and election propaganda, 
Um, my polling data looks at a number of different points here. Uh, the Pew Research Center has actually asked people if they're concerned about a mass amount of voter fraud in presidential elections. They actually asked about that in the run-up to the 2020 election. They also asked people if they were concerned about fraud in mail-in voting. Both of these things were points that Donald Trump was uh, systematically arguing were the case, that there is fraud in presidential elections and that mail-in voting was fundamentally fraudulent. And he made this claim, these claims over and over and over in the run-up to the 2020 election and afterward, hence the idea of the big lie. Uh, what we know about these um, conspiracies is that they got a lot of uh, mileage in venues like Fox News and other right-wing alternative sources like um, Newsmax, OAN, and so on. Uh, and we know, uh, furthermore, that people who consume Fox News were significantly more likely to fall into these conspiracies. I actually talk about this in a recent piece I wrote for Salon.com, where uh, the Dominion Voting Company is now suing Fox News for defamation because uh, they were systematically trafficking in these conspiracies without presenting uh, alternative views and without sort of contradicting what the Trump administration and Rudy Giuliani and other supporters of the administration like Sidney Powell were saying. This is a serious lawsuit involving billions of dollars now. Uh, and and the, the, the Dominion, the voting company, has a serious case, right? Because you've got this actual evidence now that I talk about in my salon piece where uh, people who listen to Fox News are significantly more likely to think that these things are true regarding alleged mail-in voter fraud and, and fraud in presidential elections, to the point where uh, almost 60% of them think that it's, it's real. People who rely heavily on Fox News think that it's real. Uh, whereas, you know, it's much, much less than half for people who are not relying primarily on Fox News for their information, maybe more like a quarter or, or less. Um, so yeah, so Fox News is a really important point here. Uh, people who get their information from Fox, from talk radio, which is a notoriously right-wing Republican venue, are also more likely to buy into um, big lie election conspiracy propaganda. People who rely on social media are as well. They're different than people who rely on traditional print media like uh, the Washington Post or radio like NPR when people are asked about if they consume NPR or CNN for that matter. Like these, they're just systematically fundamentally different. People who rely on those traditional venues are significantly less likely to buy into the election propaganda than people who use social media. Now, again, this is controlling, taking into account people's partisanship, their ideology. So it's not just people operating in echo chambers in these social media venues. It's across the board. These, these social media outlets are having this kind of impact uh, based upon the data that I'm looking at. So this is something to be concerned about. Why does this matter? Uh, this is something I wanna finish with. Why should we care about all of this? Outside of the fact that it's just sort of interesting to understand how people uh, form their beliefs and how consciousness gets constructed, I think that this is, there's a democratic question here. It, be having an informed public where most Americans know what they're talking about and are relatively well informed, whether that's on every issue or not is not the case here, but just generally speaking, you know, having that kind of informed public is the lifeblood of any substantive significant democracy, right? Uh, people need to be in, informed. And if they are systematically being misinformed, because they're being fed bad information, then it's gonna be hard for them to make educated choices when it comes to forming political beliefs, when it comes to voting, and when it comes time for other kinds of political activities. Um, and this is a concern if you have elite political actors like the Republican party that are systematically trafficking in conspiracies because they are using various media, including um, Fox News, cable, talk radio, alternative informational sources like InfoWars, social media, you know, they are using, they are utilizing these venues in, in very decentralized ways when we talk about social media and Republican users disseminating this content. And this really is a threat to, to, to democracy, I think. I think part of why we should be concerned about this is that we have moved past this argument that this is simply about people being ignorant. That would be bad enough if people were ignorant, because again, you need to have informed people for a relevant democracy to exist. But now we're seeing the potential for this to spill over into violence too. And this has a destabilizing impact. Um, if people go and, and um, invade the Capitol building, right, on January 6th, and they're calling to hang Mike Pence and uh, hang Nancy Pelosi, right, and they're engaged in violence and people are dying, 
then that means that this is not just about people being ignorant, it's about actual threats to a Republican system of government and electoralism. When you have that being coordinated alongside a president who's trying to get his vice president and other Republicans to not certify the election, right? Like these things are happening at the same time. And this is dangerous because of the threat of violence. Um, so January 6th, uh, the, the big lie as stoking violence, that's an important thing that we can't discount. QAnon, QAnon itself as a movement is premised upon the idea of embracing violence against the Democratic Party and the Democrats should be executed in public as Donald Trump anoints himself as the next president slash dictator in chief. That's a very cultish thing to be talking about uh, Donald Trump as, as being like forced back onto people into this sort of quasi dictatorship. And yet that's what, what QAnon, QAnon was doing. And it was not an insignificant number of people who bought into this. It was at its height in October of 2020, something like half of Republicans uh, said they were sympathetic to QAnon and its message, right? And this is, becomes concerning, right? We see these polls in late 2021, in early 2022, where between a third to 40% of Republicans say that they think maybe violence is going to be needed to save this country or uh, to be used against government to protect the people. Now, uh, I, I've, I've heard people's response to this. People say, yeah, so what? You know, 95% of these people, 99% of them, they don't mean it. They're just saying it in a poll. That might be the case. I would say this in response, if even 1% of these people mean it, we're in big, big trouble. If even 0.1% of them mean it, we're in big, big trouble in a country as heavily armed as the United States, where people have assault rifles, um, where we have made it more and more difficult to regulate gun ownership, where people feel empowered in terms of vigilante style violence to go out into the streets and police the country themselves. All it takes is a couple people, it could be one person in each major metropolitan area who's heavily armed to go out and engage in violence. If we're talking about a similar scenario in 2024, where an election replays itself and Biden and Trump, let's say, are running against each other hypothetically. And Donald Trump spends months convincing people that there's election fraud. And he doesn't even have to tell people to go commit violence. He could just tell people, like he did on January uh, 6th, if you want to uh, preserve your country and have a country, you have to fight, right? And use these sort of, this sort of soft language. All it takes is a couple of people, maybe even one or a few in each city, to go out and engage in mass shootings, right? And be blowing people away. And it's coordinated by a president, right? In the sense that he's stoking this. And we're going to be in big trouble as a country. We could be talking about a full on national implosion if this is happening in uh, metropolitan region after region. And so this is the kind of thing where I'm not saying this is definitely going to happen, but I think at this point, we would have to be extraordinarily naive to be discounting these possibilities when we see this many people in polls saying that they think we should be using violence. And when you have political leaders who are engaged in bad faith manipulation and disinformation, and they are misinforming people in mass, and they're calling on people to act, this is a dangerous situation. It's a powder keg waiting to go off. And we have no idea how bad it can, it can get. Um, so yeah, I think that this is qualitatively different than um, the past. I know people say, you know, we have the, the famous historian Richard Hofstetter, who talked about how paranoia and conspiracies have long been uh, staples of American politics. That's definitely true, but these things have definitely gotten worse in the last 10 years. And to give you one example really quickly as I close out. In 2010, six in 10 Republicans said they had a positive view of higher education. By 2017, um, it was six in 10 who said the opposite, that they fundamentally disliked the entire idea of higher education. They said higher education was bad. That's really quite incredible if you think about it for those opinions to turn uh, in such diametrically opposed directions, right? And what it tells you is that we have seen a fundamental shift, particularly on the American right, but not only on the right, uh, but particularly on the American right in favor of the rise of anti-intellectualism. And this is the kind of environment where conspiracy theories flourish. Because anything can be true, and, and people don't have to worry about whether there's actual evidence uh, to confirm these things. Uh, people rely on innuendos, speculation, and so on. And so I think uh, the way that we need to address this is that we've got a number of things we need to do as a country to sort of turn this around. Number one, we really need to start valuing education again, and particularly higher education. And we need to fight back when people start 
engaging this kind of blanket rhetoric, talking about how things like higher education itself is fundamentally bad. I don't think as educators that we can allow this to stand and we have to take a stance on this and really fundamentally challenge people. I think we need to start considering the importance of possible political reforms and pushing for them, even if government doesn't want to do this. I think that when you have a news venue like Fox News that argues in court when it's sued, that uh, you shouldn't take any of the programs seriously because they're not meant to be taken seriously and they're not factual. And this actually happened with um, Tucker Carlson's show. He was sued by this former uh, Playboy model who uh, received a settlement payment from Donald Trump related to an alleged reported affair. And you know, Tucker Carlson said she was paid off, she was bribed, she sued him for defamation. He and his lawyers argued in court that don't, nobody takes down, uh, Fox News seriously. You don't take that stuff seriously. It's just like entertainment. It's, it's not meant to be taken seriously. If you have venues like this that are doing that in court, they are not doing that in front of their audiences. These people who consume these programs are taking them seriously as an information source. I am arguing, and I argue this in the conclusion of my book, that if you have venues like Fox that are making these arguments in court, then they should be legally required before all of their programs to include that as a disclaimer on each show. So that people know that these are not serious venues. You can't make those kind of arguments in court and not be held accountable for that. And if you uh, start taking it more seriously, right, and you don't want the disclaimer and you have to do serious reporting, then that's going to be a, an incentive for you to not be able to get sued for defamation to actually do better reporting. And so either way, this is something that has the potential here to really sort of combat some of this disinformation uh, if we have actual accountability. And this could be done and I think needs to be done through congressional legislation and reform. Another thing I think, and I'll end on this, that needs to be done is that we need to really change the way social media do business. Whether it's these venues like Twitter or Facebook doing it voluntarily, or if they won't do it voluntarily through congressional legislation, I think that these venues need to be pushed to saturate people in their news feeds with actual legitimate traditional news information. Uh, this is sort of a you broke it, you bought it prescription here. If these venues have been part of a problem of funding disinformation and misinformation, and they've opened the floodgates, then they need to be part of the solution for how to deal with that. And so whether they want to fund uh, journalism on a nonprofit level for like PBS or NPR, and they'd be a part of disseminating that, or whether they just want to disseminate the stuff that's already out there, I think that these venues have a real responsibility to saturate people with good information and really sort of uh, flood these venues with it. I don't think that the alternative is going to get us very far of censorship. Because if you're just censoring what people see, then it's the heavy hand of social media companies or the government that's telling people that they can't see certain things. I don't think that we should be doing that. I think we should be confronting misinformation and disinformation by uh, fighting back and, and really, as I mentioned, saturating people with, with, with good, reputable news content. Um, and so that way, you know, people can recognize bad arguments and they can be exposed to, to better information. Um, because this is just something with, with social media. Um, how are they going to do this? If you talk about censorship, it would take legions of people and an army of moderators to curate all of people's, uh, you've got billions of people across the world who are using these venues. How are they going to realistically go through all of those accounts and curate that information in a way that's coherent and, and makes sense. Um, and at the end of the day, is that something they even want to do? Because all you're doing is giving uh, your users excuses for not using your product by censoring them, right? By deplatforming people, by censoring information. I don't think that's the way this is going to get solved. I think the way it's going to get solved is through fighting with better information and, and saturating people with that. I think it's a better way of sort of raising the discourse rather than just trying to limit what people see, uh, which means that they aren't going to be able to confront this stuff when they are finally confronted with it. Um, so I think that there are ways to deal with these problems. I think that uh, if we as a society want to take some of these steps, we can see movement in a more sane direction. I think uh, in the absence of government action and social media action, we as individuals have a responsibility to not be getting our information primarily from social media and from other actors that are trafficking in disinformation. So I think as individuals, even if government doesn't do anything, we need to be doing this. Um, and so that's got to be a part of the equation too. Uh, and so uh, having said that, I'll sort of leave it there. And uh, I, I look forward to hearing from, uh, from the audience. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, if you still have questions, please type them into the Q&A. 
uh, and uh, this session is recorded, someone asked. So yes, it is recorded and we're gonna be sharing it on the LTS Talks uh, website. Uh, so I'm going to start somewhere where people are asking, and there were several people asking, <laughs> uh, about the left-wing type of uh, accurate information and uh, when, uh, you know, there is information missing uh, about, you know, certain aspects uh, uh, of, uh, you know, like the, what happens on that side? So uh, do we, uh, how are you thinking about that kind of balance? Is it, I, 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 I hear you saying there's a lot more <laughs> happening on one side, but what, what, what do you think about the CNN type uh, of uh, outlets where, you know, like uh, sometimes we're like, could have been better uh, news or storytelling and better fact checked and you know uh, so uh, what do you think? I mean that was that was a, a confluence of several questions around that side. Sure. You know I think it's an important point. Um, I I've never argued and I actually argue the opposite in my book that you know so I, I've never argued that that some of these venues that are sometimes referred to as liberal venues, maybe you could call them mainstream to liberal venues like CNN, definitely MSNBC, right? You know, that the, the, they don't traffic in uh, disinformation at times and misinformation. I think that does happen. I think that what I'm finding in my research is just that, you know, the overwhelming volume of, of the misinformation is coming from the Republican right, but we can't find examples of this on the left. Some of them I think are legitimate and some of them I think are not. I've heard academics say that, well, what about Bernie Sanders? You know, Bernie Sanders says that the system is rigged, the political system by, by the wealthy Americans. Uh, that's not a conspiracy. That's an argument that has actually been uh, put forward by academics who present empirical research and data showing that the top 10% of Americans are more likely to get what they want when it comes to their policy preferences than the other 90% of Americans. So sometimes I just have to be, uh, I guess, really blunt about this and say, that people are just wrong when they make these false equivalencies, because what Bernie Sanders is saying is, is based in, in solid academic scholarship and actual reputable studies and research that's been done in peer reviewed journals and, and academic university presses. Um, so having said that, you know, we have to be careful about false equivalencies, but sometimes this does happen where there's bad information. So I think the best example, and I talk about it in my book on fake news, is Russiagate. Um, there was a lot of speculation, depending on the venue you looked at, and some of it was really not very good. Uh, it was bad, it was actively harmful. Um, less so the New York Times. You know, the New York Times was actually really careful in the way that they framed the Russia controversy in terms of talking about allegations and withholding judgment until the final FBI uh, Mueller report came out. But some of the other venues, not so much. You know, MSNBC did a really bad job particularly Rachel Maddow's program where, you know, she was amplifying this really dubious information like this golden showers P tape, as they called it, where supposedly the Russian government had the goods on Donald Trump and they had this tape where he watched prostitutes uh, urinating on each other. And this was really outlandish stuff, right? Like really conspiratorial, outlandish. They do have to be held accountable for this stuff, right? And so when people see this kind of stuff in these venues like MSNBC, and there's clearly a partisan sort of vent to it, I think we need to be really careful to take it with a grain of salt and understand that, you know, uh, this kind of conspiratorial stuff needs to be rejected in any venue where you see it, whether it's people on the left in social media doing it or MSNBC, it does happen. It does need to be rejected. It does need to be questioned. I certainly do that in my book, um, but these are, much less frequent cases, I would say, uh, than some of the stuff I've been talking about here with like QAnon, uh, election propaganda, COVID-19 conspiracies, death panels, birtherism. Like it's like one conspiracy after another, right? Like this is a, really the floodgates of conspiracism. So yeah, I think there's some legitimacy to the point, but uh, we should be careful about false equivalencies too. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm kind of I'm curious what you're thinking. This is there was one question about that around the sort of attraction to those uh, theories, and you know, like kind of like, do you have a, a theory around that? And you know, like the, there is a there is an interest maybe like a, a successful story <laughs> is is one that kind of catches the imagination of people. You know, like this has has been our history as a humankind. You know, like when when the story is good and uh, it's uh, 
uh, you know, like um, kind of motivates you to kind of bond with other people and, you know, like to kind of maybe even, you know, uh, be active uh, and, and work together and, and kind of put things on paper or not. That's a good thing, you know, right? Uh, so like, uh, and, and I'm kind of curious, you know, like what, what are you thinking about like that particular storytelling that uh, sort of, uh, you know, that conspiracy storytelling and the way that uh, it, it, it may, what's the positive side <laughs> of all of it? And, and, you know, like how, how does that, what does it mean that, you know, like some stories are actually uh, excellent for us to kind of, you know, question the status quo uh, and some other stories are uh, problematic and, and can cause us to, to worry uh, and who knows where we go with that. So uh, do you have any kind of like, what's your sense of that? I think it's an important uh, question that gets to sort of uh, base sort of human nature uh, instincts that, that people love a good story, right? So this is what's driving a lot of these conspiracies. Um, there's this idea that if, if you have like uh, a unique insight, right? into uh, some secret plots that the governments and other shadowy actors are engaged in, that this, there's an exciting aspect to this. It's very dramatic, although I would say more melodramatic in the case of things like QAnon, because it's not real. It's fantasy stuff. But but yeah, I mean, this is speaking to very real things. And, and, and there's been research on this with conspiracy theories that shows pretty clearly that uh, one particular personality type of people who fall into these conspiracies are people who feel a dramatic need to feel special. They need to feel like they know more than other people, that they have the inside track, that they know things that others don't, and that they're the ones who really get it. And so, uh, you know, there's that kind of personality that naturally attracts to conspiracies. This isn't always a bad thing, as you mentioned, Boaz. Um, sometimes conspiracies are real, right? And, and if you dig and dig and dig, but I think the key here is there has to be actual evidence, right? So it's actually admirable if you keep digging in the face of some kind of reasonable evidence. So for example, you know, the Bush administration was illegally spying on Americans in the mid 2000s and really to I think we may have lost Anthony. Um, hoping that he's going to be reconnecting. If you see me, then say something or write something, because I'm not sure. I hope so. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Connor. Okay, we're still on and hopefully Anthony is gonna be joining us again. Ah, here you are. <laughs> All right, I lost you for a second. No uh, I don't know where I left off there. Uh, I think you said something, uh, it's important to, uh, uh, this is my paraphrasing, uh, like, you know, it, important to keep like the creative storytelling and the, the, the good things. And then, you know, when it comes to the conspiracy theories, we, we, we need to kind of watch, watch for that. Um, but Right. So some conspiracies end up being true and some are just theories that aren't validated, right? And so how to distinguish? Well, if you have evidence, right? And, and you keep pushing, uh, you know, pulling on the string, so to say, more metaphorically, you know, when the Bush administration was illegally spying on people with the NSA uh, in the 2000s, you know, they lied about it and, and reporters at the New York Times uncovered this, like James Rison. Um, when the Pentagon and, and the Johnson administration lied to people about the Vietnam War and why we were there, and the Pentagon Papers exposed that, and the Washington Post exposed that, and the New York Times, that matters, right? Like, these were conspiracies that were exposed. Watergate, right? Uh, so, you know, I, I think the key point here, though, is that uh, people need to be able to distinguish between like legitimate stories that have actual evidence that you can then follow up on. And that's admirable when people are willing to do that because those dramatic stories end up being real. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only way to sort of really be able to do this is people need to be able to sort of uh, adopt the proper thresholds for evidence-based reasoning, right? And, and so it's not an accident that people who are highly educated 
are better able to uh, disseminate, distinguish between conspiracy theory and reality. And they're more likely to reject these conspiracies because they've been taught formally in educational settings what a proper threshold of evidence looks like, what a hypothesis looks like, and how you would confirm it, how you would disconfirm it. And because one of the big problems with conspiracy theories and, and the way they get disseminated is that people use the lack of evidence as supposed evidence. They say, well, of course, you would never have the documentation that this happened or that because the government is so good at hiding these things. Well, that's an absurdity. That's madness. If you can never be proven wrong, like, so if the evidence is there, then I was right. But if the evidence isn't there, that just proves that I was right because they're so devious that they hide it, right? And the government would never let you know. But we can't accept this kind of thinking. This is, leads you down to the road of madness. Uh, if, if someone can never, ever be wrong, it's a great recipe for narcissism and, and little else. Mar narcissism, misinformation. You have to have a hypothesis that can be uh, validated, confirmed, or falsified. And if you don't do that, you're not dealing in serious information. And this is the problem we see time and time again with conspiracies that don't accept like, you know, contemporary evidence-based thresholds for, for making a case. Uh, Jack is asking, that, he says, research shows that people place themselves in fil filter bubbles. Uh, they only get information that confirms what they already believe. How do we break out of it? That's true. You know, two things can be true at once. It can be the case that social media are, are pulling people to the right with these conspiracies. And it could also be the case that these filter bubbles operate among liberals and Democrats and Republicans and conservatives. And my research does show that both of those things are happening. How do we break out of it? Um, I, I think a good first step outside of some of the proposals I mentioned regarding government regulation would be people taking uh, social media with a grain of salt, as I mentioned, I think that people need to be relying on them less. One of the first things that I have done in recent times, after I did this research, it was really sobering for me. I came to the conclusion that these venues, uh, the way that they have been structured in modern times, have become fundamentally rotten. I'm not saying that they couldn't potentially have positive uses, and I think that they have in the past. Social movements have used uh, social media to coordinate information, to, to disseminate uh, video clips about police brutality and so on and so forth, things that go viral. So I'm not like one of these people who's going to totally dump on social media, but I think people need to dramatically dial it back. I think that we need to take this stuff with a grain of salt. I think that people need to get off of these venues as much as possible. If you're spending uh, an hour on social media a week engaged in political information, it's probably 50 minutes too much, I guess I would say. Uh, you want to get a sense of it and, and sort of move on. If there's uh, something that's being talked about, okay, but this should not be where you're getting your information from, and it should not be where you're spending most of your time engaging in people politically. What we need to have is uh, more situations where people are engaged in political discussions in, in classrooms, in uh, community organizations, face-to-face, -face, um, in town hall settings, in settings like this. Uh, this is what we need more of, I think. Uh, and so I think this is a place people can start. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it's that difficult on an individual level. And so it's not hopeless. But people need to get out of these venues where a lot of this bad information is being is, is thriving, right? And, and that's how we, we're going to be able to move forward, I think. I have a question about the practical side of doing that. <laughs> so, um, you know, like when you're thinking, and I, I'm so happy that you're, you've uh, mentioned the library resource that, you know, like people can use uh, to kind of learn more uh, about uh, uh, information. Um, uh, and, you know, like, so so what does teaching people, this is a, a question from uh, Himyan Chen, uh, does teaching people to evaluate the veracity of media sources help, or does the uptake of uh, conspiratorial thinking by mainstream outlets like Fox or MSNBC make this impossible? So like, you know, like how, how do we realistically assess the information and evaluate it and, and what do we do? Like if we didn't have, you know, <laughs> a lot of time to kind of, you know, figure things out and, and, and do that on a regular basis. Uh, so this is a million dollar question. Practically speaking, what do we do outside of not spending all our time on social media? Um, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing for people to be watching Fox if they recognize. Uh, I, I think the disclaimers need to be there, but as long as they recognize that it's not something to be taken seriously, at this point, I view it more as a tabloid format. So if you go into it uh, understanding it's a tabloid format, then okay. Uh, 
you know, it's another perspective and point of view, uh, maybe a lot of problematic stuff there, but you can sort of discount it. I think that people need to consume a diversity of sources and they need to do that in a way. Uh, so my recommendation would be that, you know, without spending a ton of time on this, you can consult a variety of sources and do it relatively quickly. I would, give, I would give people my own example. So I'm not telling you what to do, obviously, but it's just one example. You can take from it what you think uh, has value or not. Um, you know, if I want to see sort of a more mainstream source, um, you know, the first thing I do in the morning is I look at the New York Times headlines, right? And if there's something in there that I want to read further, I'll look into it. Maybe CNN sometimes, CNN.com as well, but definitely the New York Times every morning. Um, if you want, uh, you know, a conservative sort of side of things or right wing view, uh, yeah, you can go to Fox News, you can go to the Wall Street Journal, uh, pick a source, right? Pick something. Um, the National Review is a good online one. It's a little bit more reputable than Fox News, I would say. It's a little more serious. Um, and you get a sense of what the American right is doing and the Republican right. Um, the New York Times, uh, contrary to what people say, the actual reporting itself is, I think, virtually indistinguishable from other venues like the Chicago Tribune and Wall Street Journal that may have a reputation on their editorial page for being more conservative. Well, certainly the New York Times has that reputation on its editorial page uh, for being more liberal. But if you look at the actual reporting itself, you know, these people are all being trained in the same journalism schools, and they're uh, they're hewing to a journalistic style that explicitly uh, stays away from putting their own partisan views into the news, right? So it's a professionalized type of news that uh, is, is important to look at. Uh, so yeah, you know, the New York Times is a good one. Um, if you're looking for a liberal point of view or left view, you know, uh, Salon is a good site. I write for Counterpunch, which is pretty left uh, in orientation. I would recommend that. You know, you can get a lot of information really quickly by scanning a couple of headlines. Let's say at, at the National Review on the right, um, the New York Times, and, and let's say Salon or Counterpunch on the left. And if you really want to look into something into some more detail, you know, the nonpartisan fact-checking groups are really good. You know, factcheck.org, um, Politifact. You can find a lot of really good information that's being done from a nonpartisan view. And so with just a couple sources like this, if you're looking at a couple of these sources multiple times a week, you're going to be getting a lot of really good information and it's going to be a lot better use of your time than spending all of your time on, um, you know, social media or uh, watching tabloid news content. Cool. And both New York Times and Wall Street Journal are offered for free by the library. <laughs> uh, so uh, another question, maybe kind of uh, connected uh, to the sort of uh, media influence and, and about print media as well. Uh, what do you think about uh, individuals like Jeff Bezos that own news outlets and, you know, like the, the storytelling, you know, like around, uh, you know, the print media, the, the general media, like, uh, you know, like what, what do we do in, you know, like situations that are kind of the, that confluence that keeps on getting uh, more and more uh, one dimensional? <laughs> so this is something that uh, media scholars like Noam Chomsky and Robert McChesney have talked about for a long time, the, the concern with corporate consolidation. That there's a small number of people who own too many media outlets that there is what's called an oligopoly, which means not one, but a few major corporations. We're really at the point where like, it's about uh, six to a dozen that control most of what people are seeing, reading and hearing electronically in terms of print, television, and so on. So is this a concern? I think absolutely. Um, I have been arguing for 15 years in my scholarship that, that we have to take corporate ownership of uh, the media and rising consolidation seriously because it has serious impacts on the decline of uh, local diversity and news reporting, on the rise of censorship in terms of advertisers pressuring media outlets to curtail critical coverage of advertisers. And, uh, you know, and just in general, the ways in which these traditional media have done a really bad job of, of being critical of government because they over rely on official sources to produce the news. And so this was really like my bread and butter for a very long time in my research and still is to this day. Like we have to be concerned with all of these things and you need to take those things into account when you look at the Washington Post or Wall Street Journal or New York Times because of the corporate consolidation. I would add this point though. I think it's really a sign to the crisis that we have gotten into that these kinds of venues are now seen as holding the line and as one of the last lines of defense against the conspiracies and the misinformation. That tells me not romanticizing those venues, because I don't have a history of doing that. 
I have a history of being very critical of these venues to the point where most of the other communication scholars that I I'm familiar with, um, you know, they're uncomfortable with these kinds of criticisms we're talking about right now. I have not uh, stayed away from that. I've actively embraced those criticisms, but but we are fundamentally in a new era here with the, the floodgates being open. So when the New York Times and, and the Washington Post and CNN, you know, your last line of defense against the crazy conspiracies, we've got a real problem, right? Because that was never, a, a, those were never venues to romanticize. And, and I never did. Um, so yeah, I think that those things can be true while also recognizing that you know, our discourse has, has fallen so far uh, that there are levels of bad, right? In terms of content. Um, and so what you see in the New York Times is gonna be infinitely better or less bad than what you're getting on social media, generally speaking, based upon the research that, that I've been doing. There is a question by Connor. Uh, he's asking, have you done any research on what can be done to bring someone back from the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories? Uh, and is there anything family and friends can do to assist this or does it have to be a person's choice? So uh, how do you intervene <laughs> well uh, or, or, and, and, and that kind of, you know, the, the relationship uh, intervention uh, when, when those things happen to us? So yeah, this is an important point. You know, social scientists have been pointing out for a long time that people have confirmation bias, that this is a very natural human psychological condition that people want to be validated by other people, right? So they're not necessarily going to just agree with you because you're challenging them, especially if you're consuming misinformation. Um, people have what's called motivated reasoning. They don't just reason, they, they reason with a certain motive where they want to be um, validated in terms of their prior beliefs, right? And so that can make it really difficult. And psychologists have talked about cognitive dissonance, right? That people dig in further when they're confronted with information that contradicts what they believe. So these things are pretty daunting challenges. I think as an individual, the way in which we can go about trying to challenge this is number one, people need to get off of these venues and they need to be encouraged by their family and friends to get off of them and, and look into more serious reporting and political commentary. Uh, you obviously can't control what somebody else does, right? But you can set boundaries. You can tell people, I don't want to engage in uh, political discourse with you with regards to these conspiracies and this bad information until you have started to uh, consume some of these other more mainstream venues that are presenting actual legitimate information. And so here's some information I want you to engage with, right? Like uh, whether it's from PolitiFact or the New York Times or some other kind of venue. And so you can set those boundaries, right? And should as a person. It's a healthy thing to do. Um, and so, you know, I would suggest doing that and, and that's the, the, something that, that can help other people while recognizing that they still have their own choice, right? Like in a free society, people have choices for what they want to consume, but there, there are consequences, right? You can impose consequences on people if, um, if uh, you don't want to continually beat your head against the wall, right? In, in these discussions that are going nowhere because people aren't willing to sort of consider what you're saying. So yeah, there's some really uh, immense challenges here. People do have choices they have to make, but they can be nudged and pushed in the right direction based upon uh, you as an individual and what you're willing to engage with. Thank you. Uh, Brian is asking if a more systematic approach to civic education in the United States can minimize uh, the tendency for some Americans to embrace conspiracy theories of any ideological approach. I think civic education really needs to be a key part of this. I think I didn't really fully go into detail on this in uh, the presentation, although I briefly mentioned valuing higher education, but we really need to do more than that. I talk about at the end of my fake news book and the conclusion about how um, we really need basic information literacy on every level, whether it's people who are in uh, K through 12 education, or the collegiate level, or encouraging people in K through 12 and in higher education to become lifelong learners. There's this idea for a lot of Americans that uh, learning means earning, that you get a credential and you make some money. I don't have any problem with people getting jobs and making money. I understand that's what makes the world go around. But education cannot be something you do between uh, you know five years old and 22 years old, right? And you get degrees and then you go on your life and you get a job and you don't pay attention to the news anymore. Uh, people need to be lifelong learners, right? So we need to Im impress upon people the importance of being passionate about being lifelong learners, the importance of uh, basic civic education. I think that if we don't do this in K through 12, uh, to put it bluntly, it's just us being cynical. Because uh, if you think that uh, a kid 
or a child or someone in K through 12 can't learn scientific method with regards to the social world, you're wrong. Because we already do this with the natural sciences in K through 12 education, right? So uh, if you look at things like the common core standards, um, it's really disappointing, right? Because they don't talk about social science literacy in terms of the performance metrics. They talk about natural science uh, you know, literacy. We need to do better. We need to do better in K through 12 education too, in terms of, you know, this needs to be something, teaching people basic civic, informational, educational literacy at every level of education. It can't just be something you see in college for two years or four years or something. It needs to be something that we are inundated with. And that will provide people, I think, with the tools to be able to resist a lot of the bad information that they then see later on, because they, they think in ways where they value evidence-based reasoning and hypothesis testing and in thinking like a, like a social scientist. Someone has, uh, you know, uh, commented that uh, obviously and relates to what you were just saying that not too many people in the U.S. have access to uh, higher education, uh, and you know, like uh, kind of thinking, you know, uh, well, how how do we, how are we be, how are we going to be inclusive uh, around this uh, critical question, and uh, that that kind of relates to the so social networks and all of that. Do you see any light there? Like, you know, what, what can we do when, you know, like we, we, we are going to be algorithmically fixed <laughs> to, to be, uh, you know, like kind of uh, respectful to each other uh, and all of that. Is there, uh, like when, when it comes to those visions uh, around, uh, you know, like a, a positive technological um, kind of advancement uh, where where people can can grow, <laughs> you know, and 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 I think you were saying it's impossible to imagine that you know we're gonna have like you know a, a crew of a thousand people monitoring all those outlets to kind of do that well. But in your mind, you know, like five ten years from now, you know, like what what. But where are we gonna go with those? Uh, you know, the deplatforming kind of type of, you know, like uh, uh, movement. Uh, is is that a solution? And you know, for whom? <laughs> uh, and you know, like, is there anything else that we can do? Well, you know, there's a lot of important points there and questions. I think um, with regards to deplatforming, we have to sort of recognize that these private corporations already have the legal right to do that if they want to. Uh, and under a capitalistic system where they own these venues, uh, there's nothing really much you can do about that. I'm not in favor of the government trying to push for deplatforming. I, I think, like I said before, that there's a way to pull up discourse rather than um, censor it. I think, like you know, the question of where we're going to be going in the next 10 years is we're really at a crossroads right now. We can either have more sanity in our discussions, where we get better information that people are exposed to, or we can continue to go down the rabbit hole of conspiracies and, and crazy and, and misinformation and where the algorithms come in, you know, you mentioned uh, algorithms, is that we know that this is how social media work, right? You get more of what you already want. So uh, you click on the likes, you follow this, or you consume that, and you're gonna get more of that. And so people need to be, I think, protected against their worst tendencies. Uh, in terms of going down those rabbit holes. And the way to do that is in, with a soft hand, I think, uh, of saturating people with good information, not uh, censoring information as much. Um, I'm not gonna shed a tear if these people who are like the disinformation dozen, as they're called, who are trafficking in anti-vaccine information, if they are deplatformed, that's just me personally. I mean, these venues like uh, Twitter and, and uh, Facebook, they have a right to do that. It, it's their platform. So I'm not going to shed a tear for any of these people, but I don't actively like advocate for that being the sort of the way forward. I think there is a place with these venues for a positive technological advancement if we have some restrictions in place that actually regulate them. Uh, that people who engage in bad information like Fox have to be candid about that. That um, social media have to be encouraged or required to actually uh, you know, inundate people with good information. Because the problem with these disinformation actors uh, you know, is they're not going to tell you that they're lying to you, right? So, you know, that's not how we're going to get out of this, right? Like uh, these people are sort of being candid about what they're doing. We have to have the adults in the room elevate the discourse. And so I think there is a place for social media, uh, even politically, if, if we have a saner sort of system where people are getting access to better information. We don't have that right now. And so I don't recommend people using those as primary venues unless there's a change, right? And maybe these venues can draw people back in in five, 10 years if, if they become more responsible 
whether it's through taking their own action or government doing it, but, but we certainly aren't in that place right now. Yep. <laughs> Uh, there is a question uh, I'm, I'm trying, There's, there, are, there were so many questions and that's, that's wonderful. Uh, there, there was a question about the reputation of academic institutions in, in all of that uh, uh, debate and how do, how do we convince uh, people that look at academic institutions and people in power as disreputable that research in Georgia is, is to be believed? So is there a way to kind of reconfigure our uh, our context in a way that is going to be more uh, conducive to resolve those questions uh, as, as a higher ed type of, uh, you know, um, thing we do. <laughs> yeah, so how do we fight back against that? Because um, I just mentioned people need to fight back, but how do you actually do that? So, you know, I, I, just giving some ideas here. Um, I think that people who have had higher education experience, and there are so many of them in America, and have formed good relationships with other students and professors that have been deeply enriching, need to confront people in their lives who uh, engage in false or misleading or distorted portrayals of what higher education is. I view my responsibility in this as trying to elevate the discourse by presenting actual evidence that disconfirms what people claim about higher ed. Uh, there has long been this claim on the Republican right that higher educational institutions indoctrinate people with liberal bias. It's really not the case. Uh, I've been looking at some research on this recently in the last two to three years. Uh, the Pew Research Center asks people about all types of political questions related to sociocultural attitudes, economic policy, and other types of issues. And what you end up finding is that there really is no consistent evidence across the board that people who get a higher level of education, including bachelor's degrees and graduate degrees, are more likely to hold liberal beliefs. Um, they are more likely to be liberal in some ways when it comes to sociocultural beliefs, but they're actually more likely to be conservative on uh, economic beliefs. So, you know, if you know anything about higher education, you know that it's, uh, there's an incredible amount of diversity within higher education in terms of what people are doing. Like some people are focused on vocational stuff for their degree. Maybe they're doing uh, the engineering program or business engineering at Lehigh or accounting. Maybe uh, other people are taking a class that involves information literacy, like my class on propaganda, right? And so you've got social science, you've got humanities, you've got a vocational stuff. Institutions like these are, are incredibly diverse in terms of the number of things that they're doing. And so, uh, you know, people who have actually been involved in higher education know these things. So they know that it's difficult to, to have these one size fits all generalizations that are really flagrantly inaccurate and distorted. So I think that on an experiential level, people who go through higher ed need to challenge these things. I think people like myself who do the research need to present the evidence and put it out there because we really need to cha challenge these one-sided narratives that, that create these really uh, fallacious views of what higher education is. Uh, Reese uh, asks, uh, would passing a legislative bill that required major news stations to validate all information before presenting it to the masses aid in stopping the spread of misinformation? Probably. Um, we used to have a fairness doctrine that goes back to the 1930s with the Federal Communications Commission, where uh, media venues, uh, as part of public licensing uh, for public media and for uh, other broadcast media, they get licenses, not so much newspapers or cable, where they were legally required to explore different points of view. I don't think that that can hurt at all. I think it's actually a really good thing, uh, particularly with regards to publicly licensed airwaves. We have to understand the limits of that. It's not going to impact cable media venues uh, or social media venues that aren't being publicly licensed or newspapers, but it can make a difference with some venues like um, news radio, which, which are licensed, right? And broadcast media as well. Uh, so I think there is a place for that, right? Um, and, and it certainly is something that has been done before. Congress stopped implementing the Fairness Doctrine in the 1980s and formally rescinded it around, I believe, 2011. Uh, so I do think those things need to come back. I think they will be a part of the discussion in terms of reimposing a sane discourse while also recognizing that it's only going to apply to some venues and not others. Kind of related to it, uh, I, I guess, and you, you have uh, uh, experience with uh, writing uh, quickly. <laughs> uh, so uh, is it fair to call a story conspiracy if you don't have all the information? Uh, we now live in a post-fact and even post-truth so is uh, your source really true? Uh, for you, what is truth? So uh, 
you know, like kind of thinking, well, we're slowing down. Maybe we're going to have some, you know, the legislative type of uh, action. Uh, and then, you know, when when would you <laughs> uh, kind of stop and say, I got it. You know, now now I'm feeling comfortable uh, to share it because it's it's there. I got it. It's true. Well, that's a good question. As social scientists, um, I think that we recognize that you never have the truth as an individual, right? You're always trying to find the truth. And that happens through uh, a community and a conversation and a dialogue with other scholars, with the public, with students, uh, with fellow faculty. And so, you know, I'm very skeptical and re uh, reluctant to talk about having the truth as an individual. I think that these are things that we can only come to as, as a community of intellectuals. Um, with conspiracies, it's difficult, right? Because you know, uh, information is always incomplete. There's always new research being done that gives you a new understanding of reality because reality itself changes over time, right? So we're never gonna get to a final point where we have full knowledge of, of our society and all the phenomenon, uh, phenomena within it. So uh, at a certain point, you know, I think we do need to draw a line though. Like I mentioned before, if, if people are pushing this idea of a lab leak with regards to COVID-19, um, and this is something that goes on for years and years and years, and there's never any evidence that it has been put forward to actually document it. That's a problem, right? At a certain point, I'm not going to take it seriously anymore. And I feel like I'm at that point with, with the bioweapon stuff and, and the lab leak stuff. You know, it's time for people to sort of uh, put up or shut up, right? Uh, you can't keep going on with this stuff forever and, and not actually present evidence. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, at a certain point, it is legitimate to, to make that conclusion, right, to, to say a threshold of evidence, a minimal threshold has not been put forward, and I don't have to take seriously certain kinds of claims versus others, that, that it's not helpful, it's not productive. And so, uh, especially with conspiracies, right, you know, um, I think that point passed with the, the lab leak, you know, uh, that if that evidence was going to be there within the last six months, uh, we saw academics taking it seriously, but not actually presenting real evidence for it. If we haven't seen it within two years. Uh, it's fair to sort of start wondering about whether that is even a viable thing versus let's say a zoonotic origin for, for COVID-19, right? Which is where a lot of uh, actual natural scientists seem to be leaning toward lately. Yeah, I, I'm gonna go for the last question. Uh, I, I just picked it uh, out of uh, all the questions and I apologize uh, if, if I missed you or didn't mention your name uh, as you were asking those. Uh, so uh, Wei Min uh, Wang is asking, why mutual respect and mutual trust are disappearing in our society? What a good question <laughs> to, to finish today. Why, why is mutual respect? Uh, and trust are just disappearing and we're, you know, like in, in uh, having, having lots of conversations on how to get back to that place. This is my own add-on. <laughs> sure. You know, I think... Um, it's happening on many levels. Uh, this is why it's happening. You've got social media where people are balkanizing. The term keyboard warrior doesn't exist for nothing, right? You know, people have have uh, isolated themselves. And when people isolate themselves, they become more and more confident that they're right and they're not being exposed to contrary points of view. And it actually makes them weaker intellectually because they're not being challenged. And so this creates polarization. You know, people uh, aren't being challenged and they're talking about other people as if uh, they know what is going on with them, but they're not engaged with them. And so this happens on social media. It happens with partisan talk radio uh, with Fox News on cable. It happens with political rhetoric. You have uh, partisan rhetoric that has become much more politicized in modern times. I've actually done some research recently on this with uh, regard to Donald Trump's speeches, where he now refers to the Democratic Party as the party of crime because they are less right wing than him on immigration and he associates immigration with crime. And this is extremely uh, polarizing rhetoric, right? You're fundamentally framing the alternative party as a threat to American security, right? And if it's some sort of criminal enterprise, he calls them the party of crime. That's dangerous. Um, and so this polarization, a lot of it's coming from political rhetoric. Um, from, as I mentioned, these other sources too. And so, uh, you know, if, if we can sort of identify where these things are coming from, then maybe we can challenge them, right? In terms of challenging official rhetoric, challenging people in the way that they consume media with regards to cable or, or social media or talk radio or, or so on. Um, we have to be able to sort of identify what the problem is though. And so I think the problem is partly political in terms of government and officials, partly new media, social media, partly old media with regards to talk radio. It, it's coming from a lot of places, right? 
And uh, yeah, and those are the things we're going to have to tackle in order to sort of deal with these problems. Thank you very much. Uh, that was exciting. And, and I, I, I want to thank everybody that joined us uh, today. Uh, uh, don't, re don't forget, there is another session coming uh, on March 24th at 430. Uh, we're going to send you notes about that. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Anthony. Uh, it, was, it was interesting. And I think, uh, you know, like we, we're probably going to be continuing that discussion <laughs> for quite a while, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, but, uh, you know, libraries are definitely, uh, you know, uh, very much at the uh, at the forefront of those things, we'd like to make sure that people are well informed and they get the education that they need and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and whatever opinion you have or, or uh, whatever politics you, you believe in, uh, you have the right data to support your beliefs. Uh, so uh, thank you for joining us today. I uh, enjoy the evening and we'll see you again soon. Thank you to the library for hosting me too. Uh, and people should spend more time at our libraries at Lehigh. They're incredible resources. And one last thing, um, if people didn't get to ask a question, please feel free to email me and I'll be happy to continue these conversations. That's great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. See, see you everybody. Bye-bye.